Greetings and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. And uh, we are coming to you from the, uh, the comforts of the sanctuary at Mount Carmel Church after a couple of weeks on the lake and up in the trees and who knows wherever else. Uh, it's good to be back in the church. And uh, But regardless of where we uh, located, it's always good to uh, be in the study of Scripture, and uh, frankly, uh, I heard years ago that pastor should never ask, what sermon am I going to preach on Sunday morning? He should ask, which one am I going to preach? Because there's so much uh, to cover, and I really feel that way, and just look to the Lord to uh, lead, and kind of thought about something we may be doing the first of the year, but we'll address that uh, when we get to that point. But for tonight, we're in a familiar chapter and familiar scripture, Acts chapter 16, and this is the story of the Philippian jailer uh, who got saved, and uh, if you're a student of the Bible, uh, you would be familiar with this, but I'm going to come, uh, I'm going to use it tonight for something a little bit different, uh, but we'll give you the background. And so uh, with that, uh, you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 16, and we'll start at verse 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, we're all here. Then he called for a light, sprang in and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. Father, thank you for this testimony. It's one of a number that we have studied and we've been familiar with the scripture, but we never want to become so familiar that uh, you cannot use the written word to teach us something new. And so our hearts are open tonight for what you have uh, ready for us, and we want to just now give you the praise and all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I wonder tonight if uh, there are times when you think about how you met certain people uh, in your life. Uh, Some of your friends, for instance, was it through uh, your work? Uh, Were the neighbors, uh, someone in the church, or some other means? And it's interesting when we think back uh, the many people that we have met in life and remember and recall the time that our paths first crossed. And prior to that, we knew nothing about them. Uh, they may have been in school. Uh, who knows? But from that moment forward, there was a bond established that uh, was never there before and it was never broken. Uh, since then, and over time, that bond has gotten uh, stronger. And one of the things I think about is that, first of all, I don't really believe in circumstances. I'm a firm believer in divine providence, and I think God puts people in our lives. I think he allows our paths to cross uh, in such a way that uh, these friendships are established and especially when it comes to 
the time that we accepted Christ as our Savior. I uh, wonder if you think about how the Lord brought you to that moment. Uh, what were the steps that you took? Uh, maybe prior to the moment when you invited Christ into your heart, uh, you never gave any thought uh, to what was happening, but all the time, God was really involved in it, and he, as the scripture says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And so all along, you know, he was guiding your steps, and one day uh, you came to the place where uh, you knew the Lord, and you accepted him, and your life has never been the same since. But when I read this scripture, it's uh, one of the amazing scriptures in the Bible, and uh, when you talk about divine providence, uh, it's written all over these verses, it really is. Because you go back prior to the verses that I read, and this all started because there was a young lady who was being used uh, by the powers that be to really use the, her gift of witchcraft, and they were making money off of her, plain and simple. And she made a proclamation uh, concerning the God of Paul and Silas, and you would think the Lord would have been pleased, but the Lord does not want a testimony from unbelievers. The scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And it's only saved people who can really testify for the Lord, because not only... Uh, are the redeemed of the Lord to say so. The redeemed of the Lord are the only ones who can say so because they're the only ones who know what they're talking about. Uh, unless and until you have experienced uh, faith in Christ, until you know what it means to be a child of God, or you know what it means to be saved, uh, it's virtually impossible for you to tell anybody else uh, how, what it's like or how to become a Christian. And so uh, when those in authority saw that uh, their bankroll was shrinking uh, because Paul had cast out a demon out of this young girl, their immediate response was to throw Paul and Silas in jail. And even if they had to do it by some false accusation. And so... I say that to tell you the wheels are already starting to turn. God's already moving. And when that Philippian jailer got up that morning, I can guarantee you he had no idea uh, what was going to happen in his life uh, before daylight the next morning. And so he is responsible for... Uh, the safekeeping of Paul and Silas. And when I say safekeeping, I don't mean so much for their welfare as his own, because if either one of them escapes, it's going to be his head that's going to be uh, accounted for. And so he doesn't take any chances. He puts them in the inner stocks. I mean, it's like a jail cell within a jail cell. He's going to make sure that they do not have any chance of escaping. And so Paul and Silas uh, are now in a position where they've got the choice of doing a lot of things. Uh, what's their response going to be? What's their reaction going to be? Uh, they know they do not deserve to be in jail, but it wasn't in the first time. It won't be in the last time. Uh, for either one of these, certainly not for the Apostle Paul. And so they can sit around and moan and groan and complain about how unfair life is. And even more than that, they can complain about how unfair God is. And uh, the problem is they're probably not going to get a whole lot of people to listen unless they have a captive audience. We don't really know how many others there were in that jail besides them. Uh, but as you well know, when you're going through uh, some great trial, you don't really care about 
how many people around you. In fact, you don't want anybody around you unless you have somebody to complain to and somebody who will listen to you uh, in your pity party. And so uh, they have a choice what they're going to do. And God bless them. They decide that they're going to sing. Uh, they're going to sing praises to God all night long. And that, as they say, a strange thing happened uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, there came an earthquake. And the foundations of the jail shook. And the doors of the jail cells sprung open. Now, I have, uh, have been told that uh, I don't have uh, the greatest singing voice. In fact, I don't have any singing voice at all. I I love to sing, but as I read the scripture, I thought, you know, I could see the possibility of my singing causing an earthquake. Stranger things have happened, uh, but uh, it was obviously something unusual that happened that night. And so, if you are Paul and Silas, and there's an earthquake, uh, regardless of what the cause of it is, and the jail cells all of a sudden are wide open, human nature being what it is, you got but one thought on your mind, get out of here while we can. But they don't do that. And uh, all the time, uh, the jailer is just counting the hours uh, that he has left on earth because he knows those jail cells open and those prisoners gone, uh, his head is going to roll, plain and simple, literally. And so he does what human nature would lead anybody to do. Scripture says he sprang in. I bet he did. And uh, he had a sword. He's ready to kill himself. It was going to happen anyway, so he figured if he was going to die, he'd do it at his own hands, not at somebody else's. Then Paul spoke those words, do thyself no harm. We're all here. Imagine the shock of that man. And uh, evidently, the singing of the Apostle Paul and Silas must have touched his heart. Uh, because he asked, what must I do to be saved? Somehow he saw something, he heard something uh, in these two men that he decided, boy, I sure would like that. And you know what that is. The Spirit of God was already working in his life. And so I'm here tonight to tell you that God started the wheels turning uh, long before uh, that man ever heard of Paul or Silas. And initially, as far as he was concerned, they were just two more prisoners uh, that he was responsible for making sure they did not escape. And when they came into that jail cell, uh, and he put them in the inner stocks, Little did he have any idea that those two men would be used of God to change his life. And his life would never be the same after that. And not only that, those of his house. And so I will tell you that you never know uh, when God is going to use you in somebody else's life. Uh, when you can be a witness and you don't even realize it. You can be a testimony. Uh, people uh, just look at you and you come in the midst of the storm and people say, if you can remain calm in a time like this, you obviously don't understand what's going on. Yes, we do understand what's going on. We know full well what's going on. But we also know the Lord. And that makes a difference. He makes a difference in how we respond to that. And so tonight, there are people around you, if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, and there's something about them. Maybe you know that they're Christian. Maybe you don't know. But 
you do know there's something about them. And the scripture says, be always ready to give an answer to those who ask of the hope that is within you. And so you've always got to have your testimony ready. You've got to be prepared if and when somebody asks you, how do you remain so calm? You don't ever seem to be rattled with everything that's going on in life. And how is that possible with you? But it goes further than that. Uh, after we become Christian, it is a beautiful thing to see the people the Lord brings into our life. It is a beautiful thing to watch uh, Christian friendships develop. Now, if you want to talk about the initial stage of salvation, you can go to any number of the people in the New Testament and uh, look at, like last week we talked about Zacchaeus. Look at Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night. How about blind Bartimaeus? What's his chance of uh, meeting Jesus? What's, his, what's the possibility that uh, a blind man is ever going to get close enough to the Lord uh, to basically have a conversation and even more than that to have a conversion with him? How about the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus? What were the like chances of that happening? Uh, him meeting the Lord when he's going uh, to persecute Christians and bring them back and throw them in jail. And who knows what's going to happen after that. Well, I can tell you, whatever it is, it's not going to be good. And tell me about the woman at the well. I wish we had a name. I really do. I get tired of just talking about the woman at the well. But the Lord knew her, knows her name, and that's what's important. Well, what's the chances that her coming to that well that day she would meet the Lord. And on and on it goes, the people who met the Lord, but beyond trusting the Lord as your Savior. And take a moment, uh, very soon, sit down and think about the people. Uh, no doubt, you may start begin with your parents, your grandparents. But there are others outside of your family uh, that really you look at now. And for me, uh, it was some of the most godly people, and I'm not going to name them at the risk of offending anybody by leaving somebody out. But I'm telling you, growing up in my home church, uh, I look back now at the people who... Uh, were just so near and dear to the Lord. And uh, those people had an influence in my life. Uh, and not mine only, but others also. And I know, uh, had it not been for them, who's to say what might have happened or where I might be today? It's safe to say I wouldn't be having this conversation with you. But I want to take that a step further and tell you that the Lord just has a way of uh, bringing people together. And as a pastor, I'm privileged to see that. Now, there are other people in the church who can testify to the same thing. But through the years, uh, and we're talking about over 50 of them in my ministry here, uh, the Lord has taken a lot of precious people home. But there again, boy, those people had a tremendous influence and impact on my life. And I will be, as the apostle said, I will be internally indebted to them. I'm telling you more than I could ever know and sure more than I could ever pay. And the Lord has uh, taken these people who were the heart and soul of this church. And when I came here, now they're home with the Lord, but you don't ever really get anybody to take their place, but you can get somebody to do what they did. And I've always believed that if you can, it probably did not need uh, to be done anyway, because if there is a job to do, God has somebody to do it, and he will raise them up. 
But one of the joys that I have as a pastor is watching how the Lord has led people into this church uh, through the years. Now, having said that, I uh, have to tell you, I've made this statement before, there is one thing that every church comes equipped with. It doesn't matter what denomination the church may be, every church comes equipped with a revolving door. People come and people go. We have people come into the fellowship. We have people who have left here for whatever reason. Some have moved to other areas. Some just felt uh, led to worship in another place. Some were more comfortable uh, with another style of worship, whatever it may be. But I'm here to tell you today that the Lord has raised up people to do what needs to be done in this church. And for me as a pastor to see how the Lord just brought people into this church and how he has brought people into my life, what a blessing, uh, what a thrill, and really just what a mystery. Because that's one of the things that you couldn't make happen no matter how you tried. Uh, you could not have planned that. And uh, we are prone to say, well, what a coincidence. Uh, no, it was in the providence of God that he led your paths across. And so I want you to know that when the Philippian jailer got up that morning, uh, he really didn't have anything to look forward to except another boring day on the job. But I'm telling you, before sunrise the next morning, he had a whole lot to look forward to. And it wasn't just the S-O-N, it was the S-U-N. It was both of them uh, that he now knew uh, and that made a difference in his life. And so I just want to encourage you tonight to really pay attention if you are fortunate enough to have people in your life who are trying to guide you and direct you, and maybe they're not beating you up and they're not uh, on you uh, day after day, maybe you just see their life and you really do envy it uh, in a good way. Uh, you just think, boy, well, it'd, be good, uh, it'd be just good to have whatever it is they have. Well, pay attention to them. Pay attention to them because they are the people who will lead you and guide you right into the presence of the Lord. And one day they may very well ask the very same question this man asked. What must I do to be saved? You can't get more direct than that. You, he wasn't uh, hinting, he wasn't beating around any bush. He was straight out, what must I do to be saved? And as quickly as he asked the question, the apostle Paul and Silas were very direct in their answer. And so you have to be prepared to ask that question, but you have to also be prepared for someone else to ask that question and you best have your answer ready when they do. And it does not have to be a long grown up testimony. Uh, Paul and Silas uh, did not recite to them Stephen's sermon. Uh, they did not need to do that. It's very simple. Just call it, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But I would encourage you tonight Pay attention. Just take the time and think about the people in your life. Thank God for them, your friends, your co-workers. Uh, not that your co-workers aren't your friends too, but uh, your neighbors, whoever it may be. Just think about what a blessing it was. And think about the time when your paths first crossed. Uh, when did you first get to know that person? And what's it been like since then? And perhaps as of now, they may be considered the best friend you have on earth. 
And by the way, they're always going to be your friend because they know too much about you. So you can't afford not to have them as your friend anymore. Just kidding about that. But when you think about those people, and I know for me, uh, through the years, before I uh, went into the ministry, since I have been in the ministry, uh, the people that I've been privileged to meet, and sometimes it's been through heartache, circum- uh, situations where uh, things were not pleasant, that I have met people. Uh, but God had his way and God had his time of bringing us together. And we have established a friendship. And that friendship is in Jesus Christ. And now we're more than just friends. We're family. We are a part of the family of God. And I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And I'm so thankful today for the people that God has led down my pathway and the joys that we've had. Uh, some of the experiences have not always been pleasant, but through it all, the Lord has always been good. And interesting enough, when we've gone through a challenging time, a trying time, that bond that we have always grows stronger. And it's never the same as it was before. Not that it wasn't strong before, it's just different. Uh, and we share something in common now. And so tonight, pay attention. Pay attention to the people who are around you and just stop and think about who those people are and when you met them and how you first came to know them. And don't just dismiss that. Don't write that off. Just stop and think, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, the Lord put them in my life for a reason, just like Paul and Silas. As far as that Philippian jail was concerned, they are just two more prisoners that he had to spend his night making sure uh, did not escape. And little did he know they would be the people that God would use to bring him to saving knowledge in Jesus Christ. And so tonight, there's somebody that you want to meet And that is Jesus Christ. And he will put the people in your life that you need to bring you to the place where you will meet the Savior. And when you do, the scripture says you've met a friend that's closer than a brother. And you've met somebody that will make all the difference. I want to close with you tonight by telling you this. You and I have met a lot of wonderful people in our lives. But there are still millions of people that we have not met. And it would be good if we did, but if we don't, it's not going to be the end of our life. It's not going to be the end of the world. But I'm here today to tell you, if you don't meet a lot of people in this world, uh, It's not going to be the end of the world. But if you do not meet Jesus Christ as your Savior, I can tell you that's going to make a big difference. And it's a difference that you don't want to happen in your life. And so my invitation to you tonight is come and meet the Savior. The Lord had his way of bringing those 12 disciples into his life. He bought the apostles. He raised up people. Uh, he had his way. And he'll have his way with you. You'll have your moment. Don't miss it. Father, thank you today in Jesus' name. How wonderful it is to think about the people that we have met in our life. How wonderful it is to think about the friendships that we have established. What a blessing. What a treasure. But most of all, in the words of the song, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a blessing that we came a day when Jesus Christ became our friend. Because prior to that, the scripture is very clear, we were enemies. But faith in Jesus Christ changed it all. 
And so we want to introduce our friend to other people. We want them to know him. We want them to meet him. And we're just praying tonight that you will use us, uh, whether it's in the things that we say, the things we do, the life we live, whatever it may be, let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.